Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. Amen. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Good to be in God's house once again. My wife's coming up here for something. Oh, there's water. It's new every morning. We on Facebook yet? We want to welcome those who are watching by Facebook. God bless you, brother Sajeev. Another couple of months, I'll be in India with you. And God bless you up in Maine and anyone else who's watching tonight. Uh, just a couple of announcements before we uh, get going. Um, Pastor John Amaral was in the hospital. He rushed to the hospital last night with a gallbladder attack. So he had to have gallbladder surgery today. So uh, I just want you to keep him in your prayers. Uh, I, told, I told his wife we'd be lifting him up in prayer. Uh, he's out in recovery. He's doing well. Uh, but just keep him in prayer. The second thing is, is uh, July uh, 8th, 9th, and 10th, I'll be in New York City to get my uh, visa for India. I'm going to try to get it right there and then. Uh, so I'll be going up to stand with Pastor Layton for those three days, and then we're going to be going into New York so I can get that done. The third thing is, Tomorrow morning at 6 a.m., I'm getting picked up uh, by a constable, and we're going to serve a warrant in Carver. So uh, don't know how that's going to turn out, but keep us in prayer. Uh, we have to arrest them, take them under arrest, and bring them to court. So um, we'll be doing that tomorrow morning at 7 o'clock. So by the time we get there and everything, we're going to be waiting for them. Uh, hopefully it's not uh, a bad day. <laughs> I like it when it goes nice. When it goes rough, then we have to get rough, but, but uh, we hope it goes nice. Amen? Praise the Lord. Okay, well, we're here to study the Bible, right? Praise the Lord. So you have your Bibles tonight. We're going to be continuing on in the study. You can put this down just a little bit. We're going to be studying on the interpreting of principles. Uh, on principles, parables, I'm sorry. Interpreting on parables. We only got about two or three more lessons left, I think, and then we'll be we'll be finished. And then we'll seek the Lord where we, where we should go with that. Maybe we'll go with uh, some uh, some different theology, maybe systematic theology. I don't know. We're not. I'm not sure yet. Uh, maybe I'll have one of you teach Bible study. You know, pick a couple of you to do a Bible study on Wednesday night. Amen. You can do that, right, Vicky? <laughs> Your She's an interpreter. She says, my English is not that good. I'll tell you what, speak in Portuguese and interpret. <laughs> okay, tonight's lesson is on interpreting parables. And uh, it's good that, uh, that we can uh, learn how to interpret the Bible. It's very important that we do learn how to interpret the Bible. It's very... Um, Important because today we're seeing so much that's going on and being passed as the church of Jesus Christ when actually it's a church of self. It's not the church of Jesus Christ. And the reason being is that they become uh, so wanting to uh, adapt to the things of the world and the ways of the world by trying to attract them that they're actually... Uh, it was amazing. I, I was talking to a girl that goes to a church, okay, and I asked her, I said, I, uh, she goes to a very big church. It's in Texas. Goes to a very large church. International ministry is on television. And she said she was a Christian. Okay. And I asked her, have you been born again? And she had no idea what being born again is. So just because somebody says they're a Christian doesn't mean that they're a Christian. You have to be born again to be a Christian. If you don't know what it means to be born again, then you're not saved. And a lot of people equate going to church and getting involved in church business, and that makes you a Christian. That doesn't make you a Christian. So, again, uh, so we have to know how to interpret the Bible, and there's different aspects of interpreting the Scriptures, and we've talked a lot about, I've gone through this whole uh, series here, and this is my teacher's manual, by the way. And um, tonight, interpreting parables to understand that when Jesus spoke in parables, a lot of times... It has a different meaning. It has an earthly meaning. Uh, it's an earthly saying with a heavenly meaning, but we're going to get into that. Okay, so what is a parable? We're going to get into that tonight. A parable is a short, simple story from which a moral lesson can be drawn from. 
Now, there's four aspects to this that we're going to touch on tonight. Number one, a parable is usually a fictitious story that could be true. We'll get into that also. Secondly, a parable draws from images and events that would be familiar to the listener. If you know some of the things that Jesus was saying about the sheep know my voice. If you understand who he was talking to at the time, and you have the background in the back of your mind, they were talking to shep- Jewish people who knew about shepherds, and who knew about, uh, and I'm just giving this as an example, who knew that when shepherds gathered together, and they would fellowship, and all of their sheep would be in the pastures, that when a shepherd would call his sheep, all of the sheep would lift their head, and as they saw the shepherd walking, okay, before them, not behind them, okay, they would instantly begin to follow him. So they knew that, all right? And that's how you can draw that analogy. So again, so number three, the, a parable is constructed of symbolism that must be interpreted to be understood. There has to be an interpretation to that so that you and I can understand that. And number four, a parable is aimed at communicating a spiritual truth, usually one primary truth. As some have said, it is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. There's a, there's a, there's a, 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 a spiritual meaning behind it. Now, the concept and use of parables is found both in the Old Testament and in the New. And the Hebrew word that is often translated parable in the Old Testament is mashal. It's, uh, if you have a Strong's Concordance, I think most of you, remember I gave you that big, thick book. How many use that, by the way? All right. You should, should once in a while go back and look at the Hebrew roots because you can learn a lot from that. It's the number 4912. That should be in your, I think that should be in your, your syllabus there. <clears throat> We're going to look for a moment at Psalm 78, verse 1 to 3. Psalm 78, verse 1 to 3. Praise the Lord. He says, give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in parables. So you see the Lord is speaking here, and he says, I'm going to open my mouth in parables. I will utter dark sayings of old. What we have heard and known, what our fathers have told us. So anyone that says to you, we're a New Testament church, we don't have an Old Testament, we don't deal with the Old Testament scriptures, run. Okay? Because God gave us the complete from Genesis to Revelation. And everything that's in the Old Testament was written for our learning, for our example, for our instruction. You can learn a lot. I know that uh, God has always drawn me to the Old Testament. And uh, if you read the Old Testament, some people don't want to read it because it's, it's... you got to really think about what you're reading. Who, who is there? You've got to put all the principles of interpretation when you read the Old Testament. Who is he speaking? Why was he speaking? When was he speaking? Okay, all of those questions that we have to ask to get the proper interpretation of Scripture. So, so many people just pick up the Bible and they, they speed read it. And that's not good because you're not really giving the Holy Spirit time to speak to you or to show you truths, or to take you down some avenues that you probably have never traveled before. Because the Bible says the Spirit searches the deep things of God. And that doesn't mean you go into a room and you go, ooh. No, it means you're going to start getting into the Scripture, and the Holy Spirit will bring you deeper into the Scripture. Amen? Okay. The word literally means a parable, similitude, proverb, song, or a poem. And the word... Parable is usually use of its extended story with a, with, a moral, with a moral, while a proverb is a sentence, an opinion, or a saying containing an ethical wisdom. In both cases, they are often extended similes. Remember, we talked about that a little weeks ago. Okay? And the word is translated parable, proverb, oral, oracle, or saying. And this word <coughs> excuse me, is used most often in connection with the book of Proverbs. And you'll see that. The book of Proverbs is a collection of short, pithy statements that are intended to teach 
Practical principles of living. If you want to understand the practical principles of living, study the book of Proverbs. We have, Linda and I, we have a, one commentary, I don't know how many pages, maybe 400 pages or something like that, thick, just on the book of Proverbs. And uh, who's that written? Charles Hodge? I think it's Bridges, Charles Bridges. And, and I'll tell you, if you want to uh, further study that, um, get, a, get, a, get a commentary. Get a good commentary. If you don't know which one to get, come and see me. We can talk about different commentaries. You can tell me the one that you feel like the Holy Spirit wants you to get. But uh, it's a great thing to study the, the, uh, the uh, Proverbs. Because what are the Proverbs? But wisdom. Right? How many lack wisdom at times? Right? We all lack wisdom at one time or another. And we need wisdom. So what we do is we go to the book of Proverbs. And you go through and you begin to read it. And, you, and, he's, and he tells you exactly the instruction for the principles of life. And I wish our Congress and Senate would do that. Go to... Go to Proverbs and, and the judges and the Supreme Court would do that. Most of the other times that it is used, it is speaking of an incident in someone's life becoming a proverb. Uh, let's look at Second Chronicles seven nineteen to twenty two. Second Chronicles seven nineteen to twenty two. And let's look what God says here as He's speaking. He says, but if you turn away and what? Forsake my statutes and my commandments. And that's not statues, by the way. Okay? That's not St. Anthony and all that stuff. That's not all statues. No, he's not talking about that. My statutes, those are principles. And my commandments, which I have set before you and shall go and serve other gods and worship them. What's a God? What's a God? It's a deity, but what is a God? Everything that takes you away from God. Anything that, that to occupies your time and purpose other than God becomes a God. Now watch out now, okay? Your opinion can be your God. You could serve your opinion rather than serving God. Your opinions, are, uh, you spend more time in that aspect than, than serving God. God wants no other gods before him. And those are the things that we're going to struggle with and we're going we're gonna, to you know, examine our hearts, and especially with the Monday night prayer and fasting. Um, as I'm seeing the, the results, I'm seeing some kickbacks too. But don't be discouraged. Don't get discouraged and don't pull back. That's exactly what the enemy wants. You press in further. If the enemy says, I'm going to attack harder, you say, well, I'm going, to, I'm, going to start, I'm going to start praying more. I'm going to start pressing in. I'm going to start covering myself with the blood of Jesus. Start proclaiming. We don't, people don't do that no more. They don't proclaim the blood of Jesus anymore. I don't, I don't see too many churches today standing up and making proclamation about the blood. It seems like we, they have a bloodless Christianity going on today. But I'm telling you right here and not right now, that blood has not lost its power. And I believe that we need to plead the blood of Jesus Christ over us every single day. We're out there in that world, that crazy world we live in. And he says here, he says, if you uh, forsake my statutes and my commandments. Now listen to this. You know, some people say, well, see, God loves you all the time. And no matter what you do, God's going to love you. And it's okay, you know, if, you know. No. No. Look what he says here. He says, if you, if you turn away, do you know you can turn away from God? You can turn away and go right back into your own lifestyle. Go right back into the way you're thinking. Go right back in putting God out of your life. That's what, how we did it before we were, we were saved, right? We didn't have God in our life. We were without God and without hope in the world, the Bible says. But he says, if you, if you turn away and forsake my statutes and my commandments, which I have set before you. In other words, God's saying, I set it before you. You agree to it, Remember? When, uh, when uh, in, in, the, in the mountain, when they came, came down, after he came down, Moses came with the second set of, of the commandments, and they all said, yea and amen. They agreed to it. When you and I came to Jesus Christ and we accepted him into our life, we said, come into my life, be Lord and Master. You came into a covenant agreement. 
And that means surrendering your life, surrendering your will, surrendering your purpose for the kingdom's sake. Okay, I got one amen. I feel good. He says, and you shall go and serve other gods and worship them. There is another Jesus. Amen? There's another Jesus that's being preached. And there's another spirit. And I'll tell you, I am so glad. I am so glad that God has kept us all these years. Amen? Amen? I'm so glad that we, we are staying steadfast on the course of doctrine that God has given us and that we're not moving away from those things that was once delivered for, to the saints. Next verse, please. Then he says, then I will pluck them up by the roots. Wow. Think about that. Let me ask you, when you take a plant and you pull it up, what happens? By its roots, it won't grow. He said, if I, I'll pull them up by the roots out of my land which I have given them. Wait a minute, I thought the covenant was everlasting. I thought the covenant was... Well... It is to an obedient people. Right? That's what it took for them to be obedient, to turn from their wickedness, turn from their wicked ways. And he said, I'll heal your land and forgive your sin. Right? Didn't he say that? Second Chronicles 7.14. That was for Israel, by the way. He says, he says and I will pluck them uh, 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 up by the roots out of my land, which I give them, and this house which I have sanctified for my name. Understand, the house of the Lord is sanctified by the Lord for his name. Not for the purple lights, not for the methods, not for the, the dancing, not for the, uh, the, the uh, rapping and all that other stuff that we, the churches have done in the world, okay, to try to bring the world into the church, to bring the world into the church. We don't want the world in the church. We want sanctified, Holy Ghost-filled people in the church. Amen. You, you know, the church, the Bible says in Psalm 1, that sinners are not to stand in the congregation of the saints. Ever read that? How many read that? Read it. It's there. Sinners are not to stand in the congregation of the saints. They can't, because you know why? You know why? Because they're trying to approach God in an unholy way. You can't. And I don't know where it turned in history, but the Great Commission was to go out and preach the gospel, not bring sinners into the church. Now, they can come, and if they come, they're going to get saved. Praise God for that. Amen. God uses that. But that's not the, the, that's not the rule. That's the exception to the rule. That's why he says you go out into the highways and byways and compel them to come in. Go out and tell them. You can bring them to church. Praise God. And I hope they do get saved. But how many people try to invite people to church? They don't want to come to church. But if you invite them to Jesus, guess what? And they accept Jesus, and the Holy Spirit begins to live inside of them, he's going to tell them to go to church. Okay, so get back to this. I don't know how I got off on that, but anyway. I will cast out, it says, I will, it says, sanctify for my name, I will cast out of my sight and will make it to be a proverb and a bribe byword among all the nations. Wow. Wow. So we see here that I'm, let me see if I got that right. Am I in the right place? Okay, let me go to the next verse. And for this house, which is exalted, everyone who passes by it will be astonished and say, why has the Lord done this? Why has, why has the Lord done thus to this land and this house? then they will answer because, why? Well, I thought you can't forsake the law. I thought you can't move away from God. I, can't, you, I thought you can't, you know, it's a covenant relationship. You can't. Yeah, you can. You can break a covenant. 
Then Joshua answered, Because they forsook the Lord, the God of their fathers, who brought them up out of the land of Egypt and embraced other gods. They embraced other gods and worshipped in them and served them. Therefore, he has brought all of this calamity on them. Mine says calamity. It says evil uh, in the King James Version. Sometimes people go through things because their life's not right. And God is using that to bring them back. Amen? Praise God. Number two, the Greek word that is often translated parable in the New Testament is parable. It's 3850 is the number. And this word literally means a placing of one thing by the side of another. And it is used in the Bible both literally and metaphorically to refer to the, to the following. Number one, a compassion of one thing, a comparison, I'm sorry, of one thing with another, likeness or similitude. It is an example by which a doctrine or a precept is illustrated. It's a narrative, fictitious, but agreeable to the laws and usages of human life by which either the duties of men or the things of God, particularly the nature and history of God, I'm sorry, the history of God's kingdom are figuratively portrayed. An earthly story with a heavenly meaning, we talked about that. A a pithy and instructive saying involving some likeness or comparison and having uh, a perceptive of Admontary forces. And this word is translated figure, symbol, parable, or proverb. And parables were preferred in the ministry and the teachings of Jesus. How many have ever read the parables of Jesus? Well, they're there. And why did Jesus speak in parables? Jesus switched from clear, well-outlined teaching to teaching in parables. Does anybody know why he did that? Anybody would like to comment? Hmm? Uh, Well, let's see. Let's see what he says. When Jesus began his teaching, he was simple, clear, and direct. And we see that in Matthew 5, 7. Right? Right? Let's look what it says. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I shall tell you not to resist an evil person. So he's coming here and he's explaining exactly what it is, right? But whatever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. And if anyone wants to sue you and make, take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. And that would be Linda. Give him, to him who ask you, and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. In the latter half of his ministry, Jesus' teaching became veiled in symbolism and required interpretation. Look at Matthew 13, 34, and 35. It says, In all these things Jesus spoke to the multitude in parables, and without a parable he did not speak to them, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things kept secret from the foundations of the world. We're going to get into the why. In Matthew 13, 10, the disciples of Jesus immediately picked up on the switch in the style. It says, And the disciples came out and said to him, Why do you speak to them, them, in parables? These words like thou, thee, you, them, us, are very important, so don't just override those words. Think about those words. He says, why do you speak to them in parables? And sometimes the disciples, they needed interpretation to understand this new style of of preaching that Jesus did. In Matthew 13, uh, 36b, the other part of that scripture, it says, and his disciples came to him saying, explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. So there were some parables that they didn't understand. Okay? And in the same way, I've had people ask me questions on different parables like the tares and stuff like that. What are the tares? Are the tares tares, uh, 
people in the church that are not committed to Christ. And if you read the entire chapter, okay, you'll find that the tears of the world, people in the world. And you'll see that. Jesus made the changes for specific reasons. He went from plain out truth, telling them the truth, to speaking in parables for a reason. Okay. Jesus spoke in parables. Now listen now. And you, don't, you, just, you know, a lot of people don't think Jesus did this, but he did. Jesus spoke in parables to conceal truth from those who were closed to the truth. I wrote something on Facebook the other day. I says, they're saying, uh, you know, pray, pray that this, uh, uh, I think it was uh, Maxine Waters, you know, with her stupidity. And that's what she's got, stupidity. Okay, she's a congresswoman. Okay. Made a dumb statement. Okay. And I said, you know, she needs to either repent or perish. Or, or, you know, just get out and retire, do something. Okay. And, and, and one of the, I call them, I call them uh, uh, lovey-dovey, huggy-wuggy Christians, wrote on there, pray that her heart would be softened and, you know, that God would touch her. And I wrote back and I says, do you know there are certain people that they are enemies to the cross of Christ? And only God knows who they are. I don't know who they are, but God knows who they are. Okay? And I says, they'll never be saved. They don't want to be saved. They'll have nothing to do with Christianity. Not the whole world is not going to get saved, folks. Paul even said that. He said, there are those who are the enemies to the cross of Christ. And I remember uh, Sister Miller from uh, Brother Norman's. Many of you don't know who she is. Now, I'm not talking our Sister Miller. There was another Sister Miller. Okay. And uh, we, were at, we were in uh, Morning Manor in... Uh, there was this guy that came in, and uh, he was the one that put a curse on me uh, to have a heart attack in church. And he was a witch in Salem, the high, the high Satanist witch. But he came into the church back then, and he was struggling. And uh, his grandfather told him that when he died, the powers of him was going to go. He was a warlock also. was going to go on him. And I remember uh, Pastor Norman asked everyone to pray for this young man. And the Holy Spirit told Sister Miller, no, he's a reprobate. He's gone to the point of apostasy. Because when he made that vow and took over the powers of Satan, he renounced Christ. And he renounced his Christian faith. And he went to the point, the point of apostasy. Okay? And God spoke to her and told her, don't pray for him. He's gone to the point of apostasy. And so uh, when the pastor asked her to pray... He, she stood up. She said, I'm sorry, Pastor. The Holy Spirit told me not to pray for him, that he's an apostate. And all the church came against her and everything. And I went up to her after. I said, I agree with you. Because there's a, you know, people say, oh, how can you do that? You know, you should pray for people. You know, that's not Christian. Yeah, it is. Reading the Bible where Jeremiah, I think it was, was going to pray for Ephraim. And God said, leave him alone. He's giving himself to idols. Don't pray for him. That's why I tell people, read your Bible. Know your Bible. You know? And you know, and people say, you know, pray for this person. They're not saved, but pray that God will bless them. I can't pray that prayer. Only prayer I'm going to pray for them is for salvation. How can God bless their rebellion? Come on, somebody. Let, let's get real. Let's get real. We have, to, we have to know what the Bible says. The Bible says that God doesn't hear sinners. The only prayer he hears is the prayer of salvation, of repentance, of getting right, crying out to God for mercy and grace, and accepting Christ as their Savior. That's the prayer the world hears. But these people that are in the world, they think they can just call on God, and God's supposed to be like a big genie in a bottle and give them everything they want. That's not how it works. Okay? God's nobody's genie. Nobody orders God around. Nobody commands God. No one tells God what to do. He's God all by himself. Can I get a good amen? I'm not going to stop preaching now.
All these things Jesus spoke to the multitude in parables. Without a parable, he did not speak to them. That he it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables, I will utter things secret from the foundation of the world. And the disciples of Jesus immediately picked up on, on the switch of the style. And they asked him, explain the parables of the tears in the field. And Jesus made the change for a specific reason. And we talked about that. Jesus spoke in parables to conceal the truth from those who were close to the truth. The religious leaders had just accused Jesus for the second time of being inspired by the devil. They were bordering on blaspheming the Holy Spirit, but understanding that they were ignorant and did not know what they did. And even on the cross, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Okay. But they were very close, very, very close. And that's why I want to warn anyone who's a Christian watching our program or anyone who's who, uh, who uh, downs the Holy Spirit, talks against the Holy Spirit, uh, talks against the gifts of the Spirit, and says that's of the devil, it's not for today, be very careful. You may be on the border of blaspheming the Holy Spirit. I know a, a, I know a preacher, I won't mention his name, he used to go on the radio here, around here, he used to always say, tongues is of the devil, tongues is of the devil, tongues is of the devil, had about 1,800 people in his church. Tongues of the devil, tongues of the devil. And I said to my, I said this, I said, God, have mercy on that man. He's on a, he's, he's on a, he's pushing his doctrinal beliefs, which is unscriptural, by the way. Okay. He's pushing that, and he's pushing that envelope, and something's going to happen. Do you know he lost his church? He's no longer in ministry. He's no longer pastoring. You can't play with God. You can't play with the things of God. You can't play with the gifts of the Spirit. So be very careful. That's, that's free. I'm not going to charge you anything for that. The religious leaders had just accused Jesus a second time of being inspired by the devil. Let's look at this for a minute. Matthew 12, 22 to 28. I'm just going to read it. How about if I get somebody else to read it? How about you, Becca? Come on up here so you can read this for me. Yeah, come on up here. It's going to be on the screen. Matthew 12, 31, I'm sorry, Matthew 12, 22 to 28. Come on. Got that? Okay. Then was brought unto him one possessed with a devil, blind and dumb, and he healed him, insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, Is not this the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow does not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against it shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? And if I be by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come unto you. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you. Jesus had just warned the leaders that they were verging on blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And you see that in verse 31 and 32, which I'll read. 31 and 32, same, same chapter. Verse 31, 32. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. But the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. Now, before we go any further, I just want to clarify something, because a lot of people get nervous. They say, oh, did I blaspheme the Holy Ghost? Well, there's a test you can do. Number one, if you have no desire for God, no desire for repentance, no desire for grace, no desire for mercy, no desire for forgiveness, you don't care about church, you don't care about your Bible, you don't care about anything about God, it's very possible. If you said that the Holy Spirit's not real, you know, it's really a counterfeit spirit, whatever you say, then it's very possible. But if you still have a desire for God, you still have a desire for, for repentance, still have a desire for forgiveness, then you haven't committed the, the, 
the, impod- uh, the uh, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit or the impardonable sin. So think about it. So be careful. Okay? Some people do it in ignorance, but don't, when you know something or you don't understand something, don't say it's the devil. You can discern, but don't say it's the devil. Go speaking something you're not sure of. In verse 32. And whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. You can say things about Jesus. You can talk about Jesus. You can say about Jesus, you know, whatever. You'll be forgiven. But whoever speaks against the Holy Ghost... It shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Wow. See, that's why you hear preachers on TV. God forgives all manner of sin. No, he don't. No, he don't. He forgives all manner of sin, sin except Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. That you never have forgiveness. Amen? Okay. I want to make sure I get a, a clear amen on that. He, went, he warned them not to stand against God in Matthew 12, 28 and 30. We saw that. He said, he who is not with me is against me. And who does not gather with me? Uh, scatters abroad. He warned them not to change their hearts. We saw that in 33 to 35. Either, the tree, uh, either make the tree good of its fruit or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For a tree is known by its fruit. Do you have that scripture? Yeah, 33? Okay. Let, let me read that again. And either make the tree good and his fruit good or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt. For the tree is known by his fruit. Okay, next verse. Now, this is Jesus. I want you to compare what you're hearing on television about and what they portray Jesus. See, let me tell you the Jesus they portray. Jesus is love. Period. He is love, but That doesn't mean he doesn't correct. That doesn't mean he doesn't rebuke, because he rebuked Peter. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He don't change. Okay. Here, Jesus is calling these these self-righteous people. They go to church. They read the scriptures. They pray, right? Right? They've done all those things. They tithe. They tithe mint and cumin, Jesus said. Did all those things. But he calls them, oh, generation of vipers, snakes. He called them people snakes. You want to go to, uh, if he was preaching in your church, would you want us to go to that church if he, if he called people snakes? Well, where's the love of God? That's not love. That's not a loving God, a kind God. God wouldn't do that. So therefore, Jesus can't be God, and he can't be, he can't be a man of God. That's what people are going to say. That's what people have been saying. Well, you know, Jesus must have been gay because he wasn't married. Or he was having an affair with Martha, you know, uh, you know Mary Magdalene, rather. And they had movies out about it. Yeah. He called him and says, you generation of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? See, in other words, they were speaking good things, but their hearts and their motive was wrong. I'm going to tell you right now, if I ever get up behind this pope and I tell you that God told me to tell you to buy me a jet, please leave. You have my permission. Please just run out of here. Get out of here.
You know what God's going to tell me? Go buy a ticket. For out of the abundance of the... Now that's not your flesh pumping thing here. That's what people think. It's the, it's the thing that pumps here. No, no, no. It's the spirit, man. It's the thoughts that come from the heart, which is in the spirit. Jesus even warned of impending judgment for the careless words that they are speaking. Matthew 12, 36 and 37. Let's go to 36 and 37 for the sake of time because we're running out of time already. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. Hello? Every idle word. Think about that. Every idle word you speak. Every lie you speak. Every misrepresentation you speak. You're going to give an account for. And don't forget, all liars have their part in the lake of fire. So you can only kid yourself if you're a liar. And you consistently lie and cover it up and cover up and cover up. And you think you're fooling people. You're not fooling anybody. Hello? Every idle word men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. Next verse. For by thy words you will be justified. And by your own words, you will be condemned. Jesus decided that he was not going to cast his pearls before swine. Matthew 7, 6. Put that up there. Think about this. Jesus said this. Matthew 7, 6. He said this. Give not that which is holy unto, he called people dogs. Trump was right. Some people are animals. <laughs> they made a big stink about that. <gasps> How could he say that about people, human beings? They're people. Yeah, Jesus did. He called them dogs. Give not which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast your pearls before swine. I'm telling you, there are people out there that are swine. There are people out there, oh, now I'm, gonna, I'm a bigot now. I watch all this. I get all this hate, hate messages on Facebook. Neither cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you in two. Getting quiet. I'll read it from the NLT. It says, don't give what is holy to unholy people. Don't give pearls to swine. They will trample the pearls, then turn and attack you. That's true. That happened to me one time. Bob and I were working at Adolph Miller Company. They had these Bales of, of uh, whatever they were, it was like a cloth all torn up. But they had paper wrapped around it. And I just felt led by the Spirit of God. Being honest with you, I went over and I wrote, Christ died for you. And when he came into the, this guy came into the room, he was an older man. When he came into the room, he saw that. Huh? Remember, remember the expression on his face? And he cursed four-letter words. And he, just, he took this, this liquid and he was rubbing it out like this. I was born Catholic, I'll die Catholic. Christ died for you? That's non-denominational. Mm -hmm. 
don't give what's holy to unholy. Don't cast your pearl. Christ is the great pearl of great price. Treasure what you have. Do you understand what you really have? Treasure what you have. Because think about it. There was a time in your life when you didn't have that pearl of great price. And you were lost as a goose. Heading on your way to hell. You could have died a sinner. You could have died apart from the grace and the mercy and forgiveness of Christ and spending an eternal hell. Wow. We had a professor at school. What was his name? Taught Book of Romans. He used to sing this song, I found the pearl of greatest price. My heart will sing for joy. He was in his 80s, 70s, late 70s. Paca, was it? Paca. Jesus would turn from those who were closed and focus on those who were open to his messages. Paul and Barnabas had a similar experience on their first missionary journey. You saw that. Jesus spoke in parables to preserve truth for those who were open to the truth. Notice that Jesus' explanation as to why he was now teaching in parables. Let's look at this real quick. Matthew 13, 10 to 17. And the disciples came to him and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? He answered and said to them, Because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For whoever has, to him more will be given, and, to, and he will have abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear. I think this is what you were saying, Annie, wasn't it? Nor do they understand. And in them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, Hearing you will hear and shall not understand, and seeing you will see and not perceive. For the hearts of this people, look at this, this is the reason why, for the hearts of this people have grown dull. Do you know that there are Christians who don't hear from God anymore? Their hearts have gone dull. Their ears are hard of hearing. They don't hear from God anymore. They don't hear God speak to them anymore. When they sit with the scriptures, it's just a book of history, and they're just reading to read. But they don't read to let God speak to them. They just read because they feel that's something they have to do. And they read, but they don't listen. Can I tell you? When you read the scriptures, that's God speaking to you. And you need to listen. Because sometimes... It'll be one, one thing in that scripture that God will point out to you, and you go, wow, I didn't see that about myself. He says, they have ears hot of hearing, and their eyes they have closed. That's not talking about their physical eyes, right? If they close their physical eyes, they'd be bumping into things all the time. That's very dangerous, because I can tell you from personal experience, I wasn't paying attention walking down to downtown one day. You know those metal poles with the big lights? And I was talking, to my, and somebody across the street said, Hey, Bob, how you doing? I haven't seen you in a long time. I went, Hey, how you doing? Bang! And that thing rang like, boom! I saw stars. I saw... I heard bells. <laughs> yeah, it hurt, man. I think it hurt. But I think the most thing that hurt was my pride because I felt cheap as anything, I'll tell you. You know, trying to compose myself like, I was okay, I'm cool, you know, and hear little birdies tripping all over the place. He says, and their eyes have they closed, lest 
They should see with their eyes, hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I should heal them. That's spiritually. That's not physical healing. That's spiritual healing. Right? He's talking about eyes, ears, right? But not the natural eye, not the natural ear. So he says, lest I should convert, they shall be converted and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes. Now he's talking to the disciples. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For surely I say to you that many prophets, listen to this, and righteous men desired to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Think about that. You're hearing and seeing things that the prophets could not see. You're living in a time of fulfillment of so many prophecies that the Old Testament prophets prophesied, but they never saw it come to pass. And you've seen it come to pass. Isaiah never saw Jesus born in Bethlehem, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Prince of Peace. You've seen it. When you got saved and you accepted Christ, you've seen it. You didn't have just the facts of Jesus being born in Bethlehem. You had an experience of that because you know he grew up. He came to save sinners. He died on the cross. He, you are justified freely by his grace through his blood. All of those, you have experienced all that. And they had not seen that, and you have that now. Don't take it for granted. Jesus taught publicly to multitudes in parables, but he also called his disciples to him privately to explain the parables. In verse 36 of chapter 12, he says this, Then Jesus said, sent the multitude away and went into the house, and the disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the tears of the field. Now let me ask you this question. What are some of the keys to interpreting the parables? What are some of the keys? Since by definition a parable is a statement or a story that has a deeper meaning, all parables must be interpreted. But it is important to follow specific guidelines in interpreting the parables. Number one, parables must be identified as such by the interpreter. In other words, you've got to determine whether it's a, a parable or not. I'm not going to read much of this because we don't have time. Secondly, parables must be be understood based on the context of what it was spoken. This includes the passage context, and this includes the cultural context. When I explained to you about the shepherd, my sheep, when he said, my sheep know my voice, you've got to understand the culture. Because if you don't know anything about the culture, you're not going to understand what he was saying. Okay. Just like when you don't understand the culture and you read in Luke where it says, he opened up the book of uh, Isaiah and he started speaking, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, remember? He has anointed me to heal the sick, you know, I mean, to bring, uh, cap to set loose the captives. And I don't remember the scripture exactly in my mind right now. But then it says he closed the book and he sat down. And they all looked on him as, as astonished. Why did they look at him as being astonished? He said, this day the scripture was fulfilled in, my, in, in, in your ears. So, but why did they look at him astonishingly? Because all of the synagogues, and we saw that, remember? We saw that when we went to the, the temples, when we went to some of the ruined temples. They have a seat there. And that seat is preserved only for the Messiah. So when he read the, that prophecy, and he said, this day the scripture is fulfilled, he sat down in the seat of the Messiah. And when he did, they looked at him and they were astonished. But if you don't know the Jewish history behind it, you never get that. You never get the sheep know my voice and they follow me. You never get that if you don't know the culture. So a lot of times you have to go back and look at the culture of what was spoken of the time. Parables must be understood as an overall unit without too much emphasis on the particulars. And some people get so caught on the particulars. Get the whole gist of what they're saying about the story. 
In other words, you cannot take an an analogy further than its primary intended meaning by trying to capture a hidden meaning in every single word. You know, some people do that. They spiritualize it. They really try to spiritualize it and bring all kinds of things, you know, like, oh, this means this, and, you know, and, and the woman, and this and that. You know, like, I'll give you an example. There was a famous preacher on television who said this, okay, that Adam could fly. Adam had wings, and he could fly. And that how he came to that conclusion was that God told him to have dominion over the fields and the earth and, and, and the you know, and the animals and all that stuff. So the only way he could have dominion over animal, like a bird, is if he flew. So he was using a logical sequence of thought, okay, of the word dominion, but yet misapplied it terribly. But think about that. Just like the guy, uh, Bill Johnson, who said that God has feathers. Because it says in the Bible that he'll cover you with his feathers. So God has feathers. That's... That's a metaphorical expression. That's, that's, it's not literal. And you've got to understand how to interpret that. You know? You know, we, we, we say things, you know, uh, you know, if we see a person, you go, oh, you know Joe? Yeah, man, Joe's the cat's pajamas. You know? Well, that doesn't mean he's literally cat's pajamas. Come on. It's an expression. It's, you know, it's, it's something that it doesn't mean the same thing. Parables must be interpreted with the application of other hermeneutical principles that you've learned, including the context principle, the symbolic principle, and the moral principle. Parables must not be used as a source of doctrinal foundation. Okay? Um, I think in your book, in in the syllabus there, you have a a part, do you have a list of of Jesus' parables in there? Because I don't have your book, I have the teacher's manual. You have a list of parables that Jesus... I see one person shaking their head. Okay. So I'm not going to go through that, but I want you to read them. I want you to look at them. You know, there's one, I'll just go over a couple. The two debtors in Luke, sowing a new patch on old garments, putting new wine into old wineskins, sower of seeds in the field, the wheat and the tares, the mustard seed, leaven, the treasure hidden in the field, the pearl of great price, the dragnet, the instructed scribe, the good Samaritan, the rich fool, the barren fig tree, the great supper, building a tower, going to war, a lost, the lost sheep, the lost coin, the prodigal son, the unjust steward, rich man of Lazarus, the unprofitable servants, the persistent widow, and so forth and so on. So those are all there. Many of Jesus' parables were given as general instruction concerning principles of the kingdom of God. And uh, the parables of building a tower and going to war teach us that we need to count the cost before we engage it. Remember that in Luke 14, 28 to 33? Look at Luke 14, verse 25 to 27. Luke 14, 25 to 27. Multitudes were following Jesus, and he warned them to know the cost of following him to be sure they were willing to pay the price. Jesus always gave a a preclusive, if you will, to a truth. In other words, there was a precondition to the truth. It says, and there went great multitudes with him. Now think about it. Listen to this. Great multitudes. You're talking thousands of people. Remember, he fed 5,000, then he read 4,000, so there was 9,000 right there following him, not counting the other people. So he had quite a big following, okay? There was a great multitude with him, and he turned and he said to them this. This is what he said to them. Just block, just blank that out for a minute. Just blank that scripture out for a minute. If you go to the end on the top there, it says clear, you can clear it. This is what Jesus told them. Just come as you are. I love you just the way you are. Come. Don't worry about changing. Don't worry about anything. I love you just the way you are. Wasn't that a song, Billy Joel? I love you just the way you are. Don't go changing. I know poor Tom, he's going to go through his mind now. To try to please him. Okay. He's just going to love you. And he's going to accept you just the way you are. 
just come to church and, and bring your Bible and, you know, just, you know, that's today's Christianity. Don't be, com- you don't have to be committed, just come. You can still live together, don't worry. You can, you know, you can, you can, you can have a boyfriend and girlfriend and live together, that's okay. You can, you know, go out to the nightclubs once in a while, as long as you keep Jesus in the forefront of everything, you know. And we were part of a, a ministry one time, we were up in Maine, and the sister had a, was beginning a work in, uh, this, this uh, Indian brother was having a work in, 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 in Maine in this woman's barn. And she converted it over to a little chapel. And we'd go up and minister there. And her husband came to her one day when she was a part of a church before she did this and says, I'm sleeping with the choir director. I hope you don't mind. We just wanted to be forefront with you and just let you know that, you know, I hope it's okay. But that's people's mentality, some of them. Okay. But let's see what Jesus really, this is what Jesus said. If you want to be, how many want to be a Christian? How many want to stay a Christian? Okay. All right. Well, let's see what it takes, what the pre-qualifier was. Now you can put the scripture up. If any man or woman come to me and hate not his father. Now let's stop at that word hate because everybody goes, you mean I gotta hate my mother and father? In the context here, it means to love less. You have to love less. You have to love Jesus more than your father or your mother or your wife or your husband or your children or brothers or sisters. And then he says this, yea, yes, and even your own life. You've got to love me more than your own life. If you don't, you cannot be my disciple. What's a disciple? Follower of Christ. A learner, pupil. If you're not willing to love less, your father, your mother, your wife, your children, your brother, your sisters, your friends, come on, uncles, aunties, cousins, sisters, brothers, and your own life, your own life. This is the most important part. Your own life. If you don't love less your own life, you cannot be God, Jesus' disciple. But then he went a step further. Next verse. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. In other words, you've got to be willing to die for Jesus, both physically and also spiritually. And when I say by spiritual, I mean recognizing indeed that your old man was crucified with Christ and that you're going to walk in newness of life and that you have made a covenant agreement with God and Jesus Christ. Don't let the enemy lie to you and, and have this easy believism that all you're going to do is say this one little sentence, this one little prayer, and you've got a, you've got a ticket into heaven. That's a lie from the pit of hell to stop you from obeying this commandment. The devil has twisted Understand that. What the devil does is he takes everything that God consecrates and he twists it. Right? There's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Look in Revelation, Satan. There's the false prophet, the beast, and the Antichrist. They have, he has a trinity too. Okay? He has someone that's going to be raised from the dead too. His, his mortal wound was healed, the Bible says. He's raised from the dead. They have a prophet that's going to usher in, that's going to cast fire down from heaven, just like Elijah. He takes everything that's holy and consecrated and he twists it. He takes, that's why if you see in churches today, many in America, not all, thank God, hallelujah, but many today, they have taken the cross out of Christianity. 
So you just, just be a Christian. Just accept Jesus as your Savior. No, you have to do all these things too. You have to confess that you love Jesus more than you love your mother, your father, your husband, your wife, your children, and your own life. That's what it means to be a Christian. That's what it means to be a, a, a believer. And if, now, understand when you say these things and you agree to these things, this is all written down in heaven. Now, now how many of you want to stay a Christian? How many want to pay the cost? How many want to love God more than the father, mother, husband, wife, children, and everything else, and love not your own life? That's what it takes to be a Christian. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop there because i got maybe like four more pages to go, and I know it's 8.30. Many of you have worked, and you're tired, and you're droopy-eyed, and you're yawning, and holding back. And Not everybody, but some, some people aren't. But, so I don't want to go too long. But uh, and that's good stuff. Amen. Amen. Any comments? Are you signing off Facebook now? Okay, yeah. I'll just close in prayer right now. Father, we thank you. We praise you. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord, that we want to be genuine, real, biblical Christians. We don't want to be some half-baked, uncommitted, unholy, walking in the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh. We want to walk in your spirit. We want to live in your spirit, as real Romans says. We want to follow after you, Lord. God, burn out of us anything that takes the place of you. Lord, we're living in a time where the, the world is waxing worse and worse. Things are getting worse and worse. And Father, we need to be more committed today than any other day we've ever lived. The Antichrist and his spirit is rising up. We see it's not the Democratic Party that's getting all angry and Antifa. There's a spirit of Antichrist that's controlling them and, and, and inciting them to stop what is godly, what is holy, what is right. We understand that, God, that it's not our enemies, not flesh and blood, but principalities, powers, rulers, and wickedness in high places. And Father, we need your help. Help us to let our light so shine before men that they see our good works and glorify you. Help us, Lord, to live the Christian life so that people can see you in us. I thank you and I praise you for the truth that you've given us. I thank you that we're standing in your promises and we're standing on your word. And I thank you for the roots that I have in Pentecostalism. Thank you, Father, from the day I got saved and went into a Pentecostal church, Lord, I remained Pentecostal according to the book of Acts. I'm not talking about a denomination. I'm talking about an experience of the infilling of the Holy Ghost. And, Father, you have kept me. Lord, you have taught me. You have corrected me. You have instructed me. You have rebuked me. And I thank you for all the experiences I've had in my life. And, Father, I thank you and praise you, Lord, for the people that you've given me here in this church. Now, Father, help me to be faithful in feeding them and, and, and being able to bring them to a place of a closer walk with you. And I thank you for each and everyone's love and care for Linda and I. And I give you praise, honor, and glory. And for all those who are watching by Facebook, I pray a blessing upon you. I pray that the Holy Ghost will shine upon you and that your light would so shine before men also and that you would arise and shine for thy light has come and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you tonight.